much. Young people can be dismissed at this time, if you would. Thank you so much for the evening's uh, teaching them as they can on their own level there. We're in Exodus chapter 14 today, if you would please. Exodus chapter 14. Time of the year in which we do much reflecting and thinking. The beginning of the new year is a time of optimism. Uh, for me, it's a time of eagerness of what this year has to bring. As the old year winds down, it's, uh, I think, wise to reflect on what we've learned and what we could have done differently, what we could have done better. It's a time of resolutions. Uh, how many of you have made New Year's resolutions? Amen. Have you kept them so far? We're on day three. All right. Somebody said that a New Year's resolution is a to-do list for the first week of January. Uh, that's pretty much what some of my resolutions have been, but uh, I hope that you do well with them, both, both personally and professionally. I have always thought that uh, it, it's important to have goals, and it's important to cast a vision personally as well as professionally and for our church. And so when you set a goal, you don't set a goal as a plan to fail. You set a goal as a plan to succeed, and that is, of course, right. This uh, whole, the whole purpose of goals is to do better, to impact more people, to uh, increase your own effectiveness, and so forth. So as we enter this new year, it's a good time and a good thing to consider this question. What is God's will for us this year? What is God's will for our church this year? What is God's will for us individually this coming year? Uh, there are probably as many answers to that question as there are people here today, but there are some answers that are mutual to all of us. In discipleship, we call it the general will of God versus the specific will. Everybody has a general will of God, and it's the same for all of us, to draw closer to the Lord Jesus Christ, to read our Bibles, to be faithful going to church, uh, to become a better spouse or a parent or a child, uh, to uh, be about the business of winning souls. All of these things ought to be something we're all involved in. So on this, this first Sunday of the year, uh, as we do, uh, we call it our Vision Sunday, and, and we sort of set forth a direction and a vision uh, we have for Bible Baptist Church throughout the rest of this year. If you'll read along with me in Exodus chapter 14, we're going to start. Verse number nine, but the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them, the them here is the Israelites, after they had left Egypt. He overtook them in camping by the sea beside Pahiroth and before Baal-zephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness." Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. For he will show you today, for the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. I want to preach today on that subject. Go forward. Father, I pray you'd help us. I pray you would remove distractions and distracting thoughts. I pray you'd help us focus in on your word and your message today. And may it be your message and not mine. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The words of verse 15 is the heartbeat of our focus this year as a church. Go forward. The word forward has the idea of advancement and progress. Literally, in the original uh, language, this word here in this passage means to pull out and to set forth. You've been camped here long enough. It's time to pull up the tent pegs and set forth and go forward. 
That's the idea of the word forward here. This is what God wants for our church, I believe, and it's what he wants from us as individuals. The theme of Bible Baptist Church this year is just that, forward. Uh, We've experienced some hurdles this past year, wouldn't you agree? We've had some hard times that we've went through. Uh, We've dealt with things that we probably never dreamed we would have to deal with uh, in in our society. And now my challenge to you is that it's time to go forward. The problem with many of our churches today and many individuals today is that we are stationary. Stationary means that we're not moving. We're fixed in one spot. And friend, if you're stationary long enough, soon you will become stagnant. And I don't believe God wants us to be stagnant or stationary. I think he wants us to be making progress in our Christian life. God's message to us today then is to go forward. Too many have been camped out in a place of depression for too long. It's time to pull up stakes and to go forward. Too many have been camped out in a place of anger too long. It's time to pull up stakes and to go forward. Too many have been camped out in a place of apathy for too long, and it's time to pull up stakes and to go forward. Oh, there's some that have been camped out in a place of comfort for too long, and it's time to pull up stakes and to go forward. It may have been that you've been camped out in a place of satisfaction for too long, and it's time to pull up stakes and to go forward. God was ready to take you to new heights as a child of God, and you can't stay weighted down by the, uh, and mired down in your own human weakness. I want to experience in my life the glory and power of God this year. And I hope that your wish is the same. If you stay in the place of defeat long enough, uh, you stay there and then the enemy will destroy you. The two most powerful words that we can hear from God when we are in the middle of an impossible situation are the two words, go forward. That's what the Israelites heard. Now to give you the setting. The children of Israel have just been delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. For 400 years, they have been slaves and have served under the whip of these oppressors. Now they were released and sent on their way. You know the story. God sent plagues into uh, Egypt to to confuse them and to uh, basically destroy many of them. (laughs) And so now they have been released. And not only are they going out into freedom toward the promised land, but they're doing so with much of the wealth of the Egyptians in their employ because uh, these Egyptians that God had prepared their hearts where they went door to door, got their jewelry, got their gold, got their riches. And not only are they leaving their oppressors, they're leaving with much of their oppressors' wealth. And so they have started their journey. They did so with high hopes and great expectations. They were heading off to the land of promise. Now here they've only marched a few days and they find themselves trapped. Now, we don't have time to go into it today, but God led them into this trap. That's important for us to understand. They were following the leading of God. And so they find themselves trapped. The attack a mountain range they see on their right. The great Red Sea is on their left. The mountain heights of Abu Duraj are facing them in the front. And then behind them and coming fast is the whole army of Pharaoh. There is no way out. The children of Israel aren't warriors. They are slaves and they, have been, uh, they, they haven't been trained to fight. There's no way that they could hope to stave off this great army coming after them. And so in the middle of all this, they did what so many people do when trouble comes. They panic. They came to their deliverer, to Moses. Now understand, just the day before, they're singing his praises. He is their hero. He is their deliverer. For 400 years, they had been slaves. And then God sent Moses to deliver them. And now all of this has changed. And in the text that we read, they're essentially saying, why did you do this, Moses? You think there wasn't enough graves back in Egypt to bury us? So you had to bring us out to the wilderness where there's plenty of room to bury all of us. And then they said, didn't we tell you this would happen? Attacking the man of God. It's a sad thing in the moment of crisis when God's people turn on each other. And I'd love to take a moment to even say at this time, I'm so grateful that in this COVID era, how our church pulled together and pulled through it, that's a blessing to me. But it's not always the case, and it wasn't the case here. (coughs) They were so angry at Moses. Now, I love Moses' response. And if you read verses 14, 15, and 16, 
you might get a chuckle like I did. I always have to smile when I read this passage because I like what Moses does here. He faithfully promotes God. He says in verse 14, the Lord shall fight for you. Hold your peace. Here's a man of God. He's as firm as a rock. He is standing up for God. He doesn't give an inch. He comes to the people and he essentially says, hey, stop whining. God's in control. He's got this. God will fight for you. He goes on, did you bring yourselves out of Egypt? No, you didn't. Did I bring you out of Egypt? No, I didn't. God brought you out of Egypt. He's got this. He's got it all under control. You may not have it figured out, but God knows what's going on. He's a good leader. He's trying to put all of them at ease. But can I tell you a secret? Sometimes leaders get scared too. Sometimes leaders don't know which way to turn either. Sometimes leaders are just as confused as the people are. But I love what Moses did here. Uh, Moses also had weak moments, like everyone does. Moses goes and thunders to the people, God's got it under control. Stop your crying. In fact, I'm going to go pray right now. And then Moses turns around, God, you've got to help me. I don't know what to do. Here's an army coming here. We've got no place to go. I'm scared. I'm worried. I mean, I told the people that you've got to control, uh, that you're, you're in control, but I have no idea what's going to happen. That's speculation because of the response we hear from God here in verse number uh, 15. Because in verse number 14 and verse number 15, there's something unspoken that goes on there. Moses turns around from telling the people, hey, God's got it all under control to turning around and wringing his hands and getting an ulcer, not having any idea what's going on, crying out to God, what am I going to do? By the way, my esteem for Moses does not go down one iota here. The people were scared. What did they do? They attacked the man of God. Moses was scared, and he took his fears to the Lord. That's the proper thing to do with your fears. I, I just love this scene. Verse 15, and the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Now, we don't know exactly what Moses said. Like I said, what I just told you is a little bit of speculation, but uh, something like that went on. And he's telling Moses here, Moses, you talk to them about having faith. Where's your faith? And he says then, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Can I tell you what that would mean in today's vernacular? Hey, Moses. Stop praying. That's what he said, essentially. It's the only place in the Bible I'm aware of where the Bible essentially, where God essentially says, stop praying. Not that praying is wrong. We need to pray. We all need to pray more. But there are times in our life when we need to stop praying and start walking. And so Moses, uh, he tells Moses here to stop praying. Then he says, speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Prayer is a great thing. But it is no substitute for doing our duty. Now, to go forward means that they would have to go through the sea. But they had no boats. They had no bridge. They had no way of doing it. And so the command looks impossible. But if God commands, God will enable. If God commands you in your life, God will enable. If God commands to you to do the seemingly impossible, then you just focus on doing what he says and you let him do the enabling he always will. God tells Moses here, I didn't bring you out to take you back. I didn't bring you out to leave you now. By the way, I didn't bring you out to let you stay camped right here because this is not the land that I promised you. There's so much more. If you go back, you'll come back into slavery and it'll be worse than it ever was before. If you stay here, then you're going to be destroyed by this army. So he tells Moses the same message I believe we have today. There's only one option left on the table and that Moses is to go forward. Because if you go back, you're in slavery. If you stand still, you're destroyed. The only answer was to go forward. That's what he tells him to do. Why criest thou after me? Go forward. Oh, dear friend, the message is the same today. Are you experiencing hardship? You in the middle of a trial? Hey, going back to the world is not an option. The world, all it has to offer is counterfeit joy, temporary happiness, a phony peace. The paycheck of the world is heartache and misery. It always has been and it always will be. I believe God's message to us is today, uh, today is to, it's time to turn our back 
and what, on what has enslaved us in the past. Get up out of your rut of apathy and laziness and go forward. Uh, stop wallowing in self-pity and the pain of the past and go forward. Let the, go of the anger and bitterness of past hurts and go forward. Stop being satisfied with where you are right now in your Christian life and go forward. Hey, listen, friend, before this church can go forward, you and I have got to go forward because we are the church. Amen? We've got to go forward. It's the only option for us. Henry Ford said, if everyone is moving forward together, then success will take care of itself. The only safe direction for a Christian to take is to go forward and to go upward. Stop your crying and go forward. That was the message from God to Moses. As a church, we need to go forward. Uh, the fields are white unto harvest. There is a work to do. There are souls all around us. Now, have we hit a rough patch as a church? Yes, we have. No one could have predicted 2020 uh, before it happened. Uh, we faced a pandemic. Uh, we lost three of our dearest men in our church. 2020 has not been an easy year for Bible Baptist Church. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but probably 2021 is not going to be easy either. That's life, isn't it? There's going to be troubles. There's going to be trials. There's going to be hard times. Tribulation is a part of life. So what's the answer? Do we wallow in the misery of the past? Not on your life. I want to forget the pain and the agony of the past, bury it, and go forward. That's what I want to do. That's what I want our church to do as well. I really believe we're in the last days. The way things are going, it, it just it seems to me it can't be long before Jesus comes back. Amen? We should be relentlessly moving forward until Jesus comes. What in the wide world would we go backward for? There's nothing in the world worth going back for. Uh, we're not going to go to the right or the left. We're going to go forward. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, 25, Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let thy way be established. Turn not to the right hand nor the left. Remove thy foot from evil. There is nothing left to do but to go forward. Many people want to stay where they are. They like to camp out. They like to enjoy the view. We like it where we are. We become satisfied and comfortable with where we are. You know, you can even become comfortable with life apart from the local church. We've seen that happen. Uh, some even like being depressed and being angry. They get used to the bitterness. But God is calling us out of our comfort zones, out of the places where we have camped. And he's telling us, I believe in this verse, pull up the stakes and go forward. That's the way to go. That's how we're going to see God do a work in our life. Now, why is it so important to go forward? Well, there's several reasons we see from our text here. If we go forward, we move from fear to faith. When you stop progressing in your spiritual walk, you will find that you're no longer walking in faith. You're living in fear. In chapter 12, verses 50 and 51, uh, the Bible talks about the, the, what the children of Israel did. They did all that Moses and Aaron commanded, so did they. And it came to pass the self same day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel up out of the land of Egypt and their armies. Man, was this a time. They were walking in faith. This was exciting. God was doing something. They're marching out of the land of impression, uh, oppression, laden down with the riches and wealth of that land. And it's an exciting time. God's doing something. Now, here comes a few days later, and they've got this great obstacle in their path. Suddenly, they've lost all faith. The devil will do everything he can to make you lose faith. He'll put things into your life that will replace any faith you have with fear. Is that not what we have seen happen with COVID? Many people's faith has been replaced with fear. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they're going forward to the promised land. 
There wasn't a bit of fear in their heart. They marched out of there singing songs of Zion. I picture the scene. Uh, we've seen it in different movies, but I picture the scene, one of celebration, music playing, people singing songs of victory and people rejoicing. And they were, they were out of bondage going towards Canaan land. They were going forward. Can I tell you something, friends? There's something really exciting in the Christian life about going forward. There's an exciting part of being a part of something that God is doing. Amen? I like being a part of a work where something is happening. That's a good thing. But where once in a while, the baptismal tank gets stirred, where people are getting saved, where their people are reaching out and we're uh, making a difference in people's lives. As long as they're moving forward, they were full of faith. All was right. But the minute they stopped going forward, faith was replaced by fear. Now, instead of a congregation full of faith, now of a congregation that are singing out lungs bursting in victory song. Now they're like a herd of sheep, blabbing and murmuring and complaining and attacking the man of God. They are filled with fear. And friend, if you're here today or under the sound of my voice and you're filled with fear, there's a good sign that you've stopped going forward. You've stopped moving in your spiritual progress. Somewhere along the way, you have camped by the sea of circumstances, sorrow and hurt feelings. Uh, things have come into your life and now you feel trapped. You feel like you've got no place to go. Your faith has been replaced by fear. And my challenge to you today is, friend, unless you pull up those stakes, get on the move again, you're going to be in trouble. Go forward. That was the command. God wants to replace fear with faith. And that comes by going forward. Secondly, when we go forward, we avoid murmuring and complaining. Fear, in, in the children of Israel here, replaced faith. And the very next thing we see is complaining set in. Verses 11 and 12, they put all the blame on Moses of the problems. They complained and murmured. I read a story about a monk that joined a monastery. He took on a vow of silence. And this vow of silence was strange because they, <coughs> they allowed him to say, Two words every year. And so he spent a whole year in complete and utter silence. At the end of that year, he was pulled into the office of the director, and he was allowed two words, and he said, food, bad. Yes, the food was bad. Well, that's all he could say. He only had two words, so he went back and went about his business and went a whole other year, not said one word. And at the end of that year, he's pulled in again, and he says, bed hard. I guess his bed was hard. Well, he goes back, spends another whole year, and he gets after the third year. He's been there three years now, complete silence. He comes in, he gets his two words, and he says, I quit. <laughs> and his leader said, it doesn't surprise me a bit. You've done nothing but complain since you got here. Amen? <laughs> and some people love to complain. Some people complain all the time. Can I tell you, complaining is a sure sign of no forward progress. Uh, instead of victorious marching, they are standing there murmuring and complaining against Moses and God. It happens all the time. Do you know who the murmurers and the complainers are? They're people who are not growing in the Lord anymore. They're people who only come to church occasionally. They're the people who gossip more than they pray. They're the people who never crack open a Bible. They're the people who have stopped going forward in their Christian life. When you are marching forward for God, when you're letting him use you, then you don't have time to complain. Uh, if you're spending time in your Bible, if you're spending time with the Lord in prayer, if you are growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, like it talks about in 2 Peter 3, there's no room for complaining in your life if you're busy about the business of God. Does that mean that nothing will go wrong? No. <laughs> Things always go wrong. There's always troubles. Life isn't easy. Uh, trial is always just around the corner. But in the midst of it all, we need to keep going forward with an eye on the promised land. When you do, you won't have time to murmur and complain. Next, when we go forward, it prevents a backsliding spirit. Look what they did here. I can't believe this. They came to the point where they said to Moses, why don't you just take us back to Egypt? It'd be better for us to be back in Egypt. Now, can you imagine that? They have suffered oppression for 400 years. For 400 years, they have been living under the whip. Can you imagine living under a whip where you're a slave 
uh, put to the work in the hot sun every day at the behest of your master. Now within days, they're standing there and they're saying, we'd have been better off in Egypt. Why would anybody want to go back to Egypt? A world of sin and bondage and slavery. Yet here they are, they're looking over their shoulders, back to where they came from, and they're looking to the right, looking to the left, they're thinking of returning to a life of misery, a life of despair, something they had prayed for for 400 years to get out of that life. Why? One reason why. They stopped going forward. When you stop going forward, you're going to start going backward. That's just the way it is in the Christian life. In the, when the past looks better than the future, you've stopped moving forward. When you start to move backward uh, and backsliding in your Christian life, why would anyone want to go back to the life that God saved them from? Don't let this be you. We see it all the time, but don't let this be you. Uh, you there, I can promise you, as hard as the Christian life is, it is infinitely better than the life Satan's got for you. Amen? Infinitely better. Just keep going forward. One more point before we move on to the next section here uh, to make here. If you aren't going forward, then you will obstruct those behind you from going forward. There are several million people that day in that valley. The people in the fourth row couldn't go forward until the people in the first row went forward. And I'm asking you today, how many people are standing behind you, watching you, and waiting for you to begin moving forward? Maybe you're a dad in here, maybe you're a mom, you've got children, or maybe you're a, a patriarch of a family or whatever the case might be, and your family's watching you, your children are watching you. And I tell you, Dad, it's time to move forward. It's time to do some things for God that you've never thought were even possible, and God wants to do those through you. Go forward. You see it all through the Bible. When God's people move in faith, God moves in response. It wasn't until David rushed the giant that God brought the victory. It wasn't until Noah had pounded nails for 120 years. It was that God saved his family. It wasn't until Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego took a stand before God removed the teeth of that fire and uh, quelled it. It wasn't until Gideon blew the trumpet that God defeated the Midianites with only 300. God is always waiting to move for us to take that first step. Now, we like to have it backward. We Sometimes we think, well... You know, if God does it, if God acts, then I'll act. That's not the way it works. God wants us to take a step of faith. He is just the same way in giving. Uh, God wants to bless you, friend, but he says, give, and it shall be given unto you. So we have to take that step of faith. We have to do what it tells us in Malachi 3. We've got to bring our tithes and offerings to the storehouse, and then, he says, will I open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. God waits for you to act, and then God will act. Listen, the same thing <coughs> happened with Peter. Peter did not walk on the water until he went forward. He didn't, he didn't have that great miracle. By the way, we might give Peter a hard time for sinking, but as far as I know, other than Jesus Christ, he's still the only man in history that walked on water. Amen? Now, I walk on water all the time, but it's frozen. It's a little different than what Peter did. We can all walk on water here in South Dakota, can't we? But Peter walked on water without ice on top of it. God wants to do miraculous. God wants to, you to have great victory in your life. God wants to do great things through you. You've got to go forward. What will God do for this church in 2021 if we obey those two words? Go forward. What will God do through you if you obey those two words and go forward? To revisit our goals of 2020, <coughs> last year's theme was that we would be found faithful. Goal number one was that, that we would be found faithful. Reading our Bibles, loving my families, or loving our families, uh, prayer, witnessing to those we meet. How did you do in 2020? Do a self-inventory. Were you more faithful in one area of your life? Number two, increased attendance for secondary services. I use the term secondary services not because they're not as important, but because Sunday morning or Sunday night's just as important as Sunday morning, Wednesday night's just as important as Sunday night, and so I really wanted to put a focus on this, and we did. We talked about how you need three to thrive. We began the year with a focus on adding 
a service to your current pattern. So if you come only on Sunday morning, that you would add Sunday night. Hey, is God important enough for us to add a second service to our pattern? I believe so. And so that was one of our goals. And, uh, it, it, and people stepped up and people started coming. And then I had to write a letter that told everybody in our church, don't come to church, stay home. You, don't, you can't imagine how hard that was to write that letter because of COVID. We just didn't know what was going on. And so for a few weeks, we weren't coming at all. And ever since then, it's just been a slow uh, pullback. I, I will say, though, I have been amazed at God's people in this church being found faithful because it looked a little different than what I expected it to look like. When I was preaching this Sunday last year, and we were talking about, man, we're going to, we want to pack this place out every service and keep people come. It, it looked a little different, but I still saw faithfulness. Amen. Second, or thirdly, our goal, one of our goals was universal discipleship. Over the course of the past few years, uh, we've had this policy where every person in any form of leadership in our church <coughs> has to go through discipleship, and most of our members have. And if you haven't, by the way, I encourage you to uh, be a part of this, uh, and there's a reason for it. The reason that we have, that we do disciple, put so much focus on it, is we only want fat people to serve at Bible Baptist Church. That's right. We only want fat people. Faithful, available, and teachable. Amen? It's an acrostic, not a description. So don't get nervous, but that's what we want. We want fat people to serve at Bible Baptist. And so uh, I'm proud to announce that this has been uh, very successful this year. People have gotten on board with it. Everyone that's joined our church in 2020 has uh, signed up or has already completed discipleship, so it was a blessing. Number four, <clears throat> that you and I would all be found more faithful in at least one area of our lives. I'm not going to tell you what, maybe I'll tell you at some point what mine was, but I had a specific area. I wanted to sh step up my game in my life and be more faithful, and by God's grace, I did it. I achieved that one goal in my life. I'm asking you, how did you do? Uh, hopefully you've stepped up in some area. You're more faithful now than you were in some area uh, than you were last January. So those are some of the goals. Uh, we've, we, uh, you know, we dealt with some things. We dealt with COVID. We dealt with a shutdown. We've lost some people. We've gained others. Be faithful. All right, now our 2021 goals. What are some of our goals? Listen, it's never, here's number one statement. It's never the will of God to retreat. Amen? It's never the will of God to move backward. And so in that spirit, we want to go forward. We are praying and working on hiring a youth pastor. We need a youth pastor. And uh, you pray as you, as I do, along with our men. We're, we've interviewed a couple, or I have interviewed a couple and talked to a few more. And we're considering that uh, the, a few folks right now. And so you pray that we'll bring the right man, the right family to our church as a youth pastor. Uh, second goal I have that if, if by the summer there's no youth pastor that we have found yet, then that we'll put on a summer intern. And uh, there's a few men, that, young men I'm considering for that, and we'll talk to those, bring them to the men and to the church as that progresses. And number three, a goal that I have, we need to get the bus ministry back in gear. We need people for that. We need servants. We need people that will say, hey, pastor, I want to go forward in my Christian life. I want to do more for God. I'll take care of the bus ministry. I'll get involved in this area. We need folks that will get involved and do those things. But I want to see a bus ministry back up and running. I want to see a campus ministry, number five, or number four. A campus ministry. Uh, we, we, we've got a, a great mission field just minutes from here. We need to be about working on that. Again, needs people. We're also, another goal I have, we've got some talking going on about some lobby construction out here to kind of help with the bottleneck of people as we get dismissed from church and so uh, some improvement on our building. The desire that I have is not to be trapped in a rut of no forward movement. I want to go forward. My question to you today is will you go with me? I want you and I as a church to go forward. Now in closing I want to make some comments because it's important we understand this. What happens if we collectively today decide we're going to go forward. A couple of things are going to happen. Number one, going forward invites difficulty. You will find the path forward to be steep. You'll find it to be rough or uneven. Uh, if the weak, friend, do not go forward, the strong go forward. Oh, some, 
And even uh, in our church today, some will fall by the wayside. There will be some casualties. But I'm asking you personally to make the commitment, will you go forward? 2 Timothy 2, 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Listen, friend, nothing worthwhile is gained without difficulty. There's going to be difficulty if we decide to go forward. Number two, going forward requires decision and commitment. Indecision will let opportunities pass you by. You must decide to go forward in your Christian life, and then you must commit to it. Get in the game. Get involved. You know, no one is impressed with the one loss record of a referee. Nobody's impressed. Get in the game. Get involved. And that'll make a difference. Psalm 37, 5. Commit thy ways unto the Lord. Trust in him and he shall bring it to pass. And what way is that? The way is forward. It's the only way for us to move. Go forward. Number three, going forward requires endurance. The march Sometimes will be slow, arduous, and challenging. There will be times in your life and in our church when we need to heed the warning of Hebrews 10.36. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. We've got to have patience. We've got to have commitment. We've got to <clears throat> have endurance and keep on going even when the going gets tough. Hudson Taylor says, you must go forward on your knees. <laughs> That's kind of hard to picture, but isn't that the truth, spiritually speaking? We go forward, we do so on our knees. And my challenge today to you, friend, is will you go forward? Will you achieve new heights in your Christian life that you never thought possible? You can do it if you make this commitment to go forward. I tell you, friend, you take that step and God will come through for you. God wants to do great things through you, and he wants to do great things in you. To do that, you need to have the faith, even though there's a great big ocean in front of you, even though there's mountains beside you, to go forward. And God will do the miraculous in your life. We thank you, Father, for each and every one today. I pray that we might have a combined commitment today. Maybe we might have a common desire that we want to see more. We want to see more than we've seen in the past. We want to see more through our church. We want to see more through our personal lives. We want to go forward. Speaking for myself, Lord, I want to go forward in my personal life. I want the, uh, the, those in my own family that we go forward. I pray that for those in our church that we go forward. And now as we have a moment to commit this to you, I pray, Lord, that you'd lead and guide. We pray in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed still. I want to challenge your friend today. Will you commit this in your life along with me to go forward?